Robert resents is patriarchy. We're here to do work as men, as patriarchs. There's nothing more natural than being a father. Welcome back to 21 Convention 2019 in Orlando, Florida, special Patriarch Edition. I'm honored to be announcing our next speaker. I brought him up in my speech. I've been friends with the man for years. He's been in, uh, involved with 21 Con longer than I. Since 2016, he's been a part of this, spreading the message, setting an example for other men, you know, putting himself out there for others, making himself totally available. Any questions asked, he'll answer for you. He gives you his time, his energy, and when he's speaking to you, it's like there's nothing else going on. He gives you his undivided attention. So Tanner Guzzi will be the next speaker. He writes at masculine-style.com, but he's more than just the style guy. Everybody pins that on him. He's about style. He looks good. He makes me feel self-conscious in everything I wear. That's what he does, though. He's very good at what he does. He's a professional in his craft, and he makes other men dress intentionally. He makes other men better. But he's also a man, a patriarch, and a leader. And when you see men like that, and you see men who are, they're broadening that scope, you like to pigeonhole them and put them into one area and say that's the comfortable part. But here's the thing about Tanner. Everything in his life, everything he does comes from an authentic position. It's not just being the style guy, it's being a leader. It's being a man who will help others and lead his family and lead himself to greater glory. So with that, he's going to be leading you to higher grounds and raising your standard in everything it is that you do. The patriarch, not the style guy, Tanner Guzzi. Hey guys, I am excited to talk to you today, especially because I've been doing public speaking. I'm 34 and I've been doing public speaking for 30 years. I uh, remember giving talks in church when I was four years old and having to get up and talk about things. And you know, I've had to speak as an authority about things for the last 15 years, whether that's teaching people about my beliefs or being involved with 21Con, Menfluential, other events that I've been involved with. And I'm really excited to talk to you today because I'm not talking to you as an authority today. If I were to be speaking to you guys about style, the importance of your appearance, how to better present yourselves and how to have a better presence, a stronger presence, better presentation, I'm, I'm an authority in that arena. But when it comes to being a father, when it comes to being a patriarch, my kids are young. I've got four. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the skin that I have in the game when it comes to this idea of, of being a father and being a patriarch. I've got four kids. Happily married, been married for eight years. Uh, my wife stays home full time. She, uh, she gets to stay home full time with the kids. We're very blessed and very lucky that men like you who hire me as a coach, I make a good enough living off of doing that, that I get to earn a full time income on my own and my wife gets to stay home with our kids. Um, I have three girls and a son and they're aged, uh, my oldest is about to turn seven. I have a son who's five, a little girl who's two and a half and then we just had our fourth daughter back in January, so she's about three months old. We're probably having at least one, maybe two more. So we're old school like that. And I have very, very good kids right now. I do, I'm proud of them and I get to brag about them. And obviously there's some bias in there, but I have very good kids right now. I have no idea if my kids are gonna be good kids in 10 years. I have no idea if my kids are gonna be good people in 20 years. And so I can't come to you as an authority figure and tell you that this is what you have to do in order to be a good patriarch and in order to raise good, happy children because I don't know. I, I haven't put in the time, I haven't put in the experience. I can tell you what I do and that's what I'm planning on sharing with you is how I have intentionally built my own family culture, how my wife and I are doing that together as a team how we've seen success with our kids at a young age and how we plan on adapting and growing as our kids get older and as their personalities diverge and as their needs become different. But when it comes to speaking to you as an authority about this is exactly what you have to do, I can't do that. So I wanna set the expectations properly and let you guys know that today, I'm sharing my thoughts with you. I'm sharing my own experiences with you and what I like to do best 
is try and take what I do or what I see other people do from a purely tactical or an applicable standpoint and then try and pull the principles out of that so that we can learn together from what those principles are and then you can apply those principles in your own lives. Because I have no idea how you men can become better patriarchs. Your situations are different. You're married or you're not, you're divorced or you've got kids that were born out of wedlock. Some of you don't have kids, some of you have grandkids. Your jobs are different, the way that in which you live is different, the cultures that you belong to are very different. I cannot give you, nobody in here can give you a prescription as far as this is how to be a successful patriarch. But what we can do is talk about the principles that have been established by men who are much greater than we are, the men who have built civilizations, and then how we can apply those principles together. So one of the things that I wanna talk about that's been on my mind a lot lately is this idea of identity. Because really, when it comes to my own children and the things that we're experiencing with them, one of the things that we're finding is so crucial is that they have a, a true identity in who and what they are. Identity is really, it's bigger than everything. And the things that we believe about ourselves, the self-talk that we have, the things that we tell ourselves who and what we are, because we're humans and because we like consistency, those are the things that we don't want to change. You hear people talk about things all the time that we identify with our weaknesses or we identify with things like the, the hobbies that we're into or uh, the, the friends that we have or the music that we listen to, a lot of these superficial things. And I can tell you from my own experience that I went through a crisis when I was 20 years old because my identity was rooted in BMX bikes and punk rock music. Right, and you know what? I sucked at both of those a lot. I really was not very good at any of that. And so my identity was rooted in something that there was no possible success for me to have. And it was something that was so hard for me to be able to grapple with the idea that I don't have to abandon those things. I still enjoy those things. I love taking my kids to the skate park now and riding bikes together, but it doesn't have to be my identity, even though for 10 years I had told myself that that was what my identity was rooted in. Identity is what makes who we are, and if we can have our identities rooted in the right things, then that's what helps us be successful as people. Now, the problem is, the world used to be aligned with the identities that the men in this room that we would want. It used to be that you really could just kind of outsource the idea of you send your kids to school, and you send them to church, and you send them over to their friends' houses, and they come back and those institutions and those people are instilling good ideas into them, right? The world used to work that way. And some people would argue that now it works that way even better, but the men in here, we don't like that identity. We don't like the results of that world and that culture and the way that it's creating our children. I know I certainly don't. We cannot send our children to Rome and expect them to come home hating Caesar. And that's what happens if we continue to outsource the creation of our children's identity by sending them into these other environments and not doing anything to offset that. Hunter talked about that. That doesn't mean you have to homeschool. We've made that decision. But it does mean that when your kids home, when they do come home from school, you have to talk to them about what they've done, what they've learned, what they think about that. How does that jive with the things that we're trying to teach them as parents? because we have to be the primary source of what their identities are. Everything else needs to be secondary. Otherwise, Rome gets to choose who our kids are, and Rome isn't interested in our kids' best interest. Rome is only interested in creating the best citizens for Rome. I don't want my kids to be fodder for Rome. I don't want my kids to be part of Babylon. I want my kids to reach their full potential. And that's my responsibility as a patriarch to create the culture that gives them that sense of identity, reinforces that, and teaches them to reach their full potential rather than just outsourcing that to somebody else. We don't get that luxury anymore. Now, identity is not something that's created by things like law. It's not created by logic. It's not created by mandate. Identity is created by culture. And culture is the driver of everything. 
Politics, law, everything else is downstream of culture. And culture are the things that groups of people agree upon are things like morals and beliefs and systems and rituals and language and appearance and all these other variables that create this idea of a collective identity and then the individuals need to determine how they fit individually within that collective identity. And so one of the things that we're doing as a Guzzi family, as the Guzzies, is very intentionally building a culture around our family. Because if we can successfully build a culture, if we can instill in our kids what it means to be a Guzzy, then that means that their identity won't be something that's threatened when they have friends who have beliefs that we disagree with. Or they have jobs that may offer more profit but come at the expense of their morals. Or my son has a girl that's really hot and is really into him, but she's not good for him. Or my daughter's can't find the kind of caliber of men that they would like to marry, and so they just become spinsters. We can create the kind of culture within our family and then watch it expand out. Because here's here's one of the other things that's really interesting about this culture problem, is that it's frustrating because you see people complain about culture all the time. Whether it's social justice warriors and everybody else complaining about the patriarchy, you know, us as the villains, Or it's people that are over in the manosphere and they're talking about the cathedral and feminism and everything else. But the problem is, is everybody's trying to fix culture on a macro level. And you know why we do that? Because we're terrified and we're wimps. It's a way for us to tell ourselves that we're doing something good. Look at this sick tweet. I'm affecting change. You're not. You're not, right? We're not changing anything. And so it's a way to congratulate ourselves that we're having an effect on the world or to justify when we don't because then what we're saying is, well, I'm doing my best. I'm just one small drop in the ocean. I'm just doing everything. That doesn't matter. You can't change the macro culture without building and changing a micro culture. And that starts with the foundation of every civilization and every culture, and that's the nuclear family. We waste so much time and so much energy congratulating ourselves because we're fighting the good fight. We're part of a movement when we're not having any real effect if we're not actually having an effect within our own dynamic and within our own family. That's one of the things I love about why Anthony and Hunter put on this event is to come and talk to men who are interested in being better on that macro level. I can't tell you men how much I respect you for being willing to put some real skin in the game being really interested in actually doing this with your own family dynamic instead of being a big shot online because you're intelligent and you can say things that maybe people retweet a few times. Awesome, cool, look at you change the world. And so we get to focus on what that micro culture is. And then once we build that out, then other people become attracted to that. The reason that you're all here is because there are other men who have built a microculture and it started to expand and it started to grow. But something like this is even taking that online culture, that microculture to a different level. But here's the thing that I think is really crucial that I need to keep reminding myself is that what we have in common, and this room is a little bit different, it's a little bit more niche, it's a little bit more focused, but for those of us who are in the corner of the internet that is focused on masculinity and male self-development, I was talking about this with Jack Donovan the other day, is that two-thirds of us probably wouldn't get along if we were actually trying to build a tribe. We have disparate ideas about what our identities are. We have disparate disparate ideas about what it means to uh, have a relationship with God or, or nature or anything else. We have different ideas of how a family dynamic should be. We have different ideas about music or language or appearance or all these other things. And yes, those things can be small. Some of those are very big. But this, the manosphere, the red pill, whatever other term is kind of the term du jour, it's not a culture, it's a movement. It's a men's movement. And the only thing that we really have in common, all of us, is that we're interested in men becoming the best versions of themselves. And we can't even agree on what the best version of ourselves is. So that doesn't mean that you guys can rely on me or on any of these other men or even on each other to tell you what your culture should be, or to build that culture for you. And we can't build that way. It's the problem with, I mean, this is one of the simple children's stories that we tell our kids, is the problem with the little red hen, right? 
Everybody wants this awesome culture that celebrates men. Men here, we want the patriarchy back. But nobody's willing to put in the actual hard-to-do work. Everybody wants to eat the bread, but nobody's going to go dig in the soil. Nobody's going to go plant the seed. Nobody's going to go water the seeds. Nobody's going to go harvest it. Nobody's going to thresh it. Nobody's going to grind and mill it. Nobody's going to knead it into dough, and nobody's going to cook it. We all just want it. Or we may show up at the very end and say, look, I pulled it out of the oven. I did this awesome tweet. Look how I got to make the bread, right? We have to be willing to do the work all the way through. And that's what I love about, that's what I love about being in this room with men like you is you are the ones who have real consequences on the line or desire to have real consequences on the line. And you're willing to build your own culture and then watch whether that actually has a positive effect on the macro culture or... You just have to hunker down and fight off the hordes of barbarians and heathens who are going to come after you and your family. And that gets to be our job too. So, like I said when we first started, I don't have a prescription for what it means to build a good family culture. I just want to tell you guys what we've done with my family. I want to walk you guys through some of what our daily routines are, through some of the things that we do throughout the week, some of the things that we talk about, some of the things that we've set as our goals and then extrapolate again what the principles are from that. So let me walk you a little bit through what a day in the Guzzy household looks like. My wife and I are lucky enough that we get to wake up to the kids coming into our room. Now for four years, if not longer, it wasn't like that because before I was able to do masculine style full time, I worked a nine to five and I was running a side hustle. So that meant that I was getting up at five o'clock every morning a couple hours before my kids so that I could get some work done. Thankfully, I don't have to do that anymore. So our kids come trotting in with their hair all messy and their breath all stinky and everything. It's 7.30 in the morning and everybody kind of piles onto our bed. And we spend the first 10, 15 minutes in the morning just kind of talking and hanging out and getting to enjoy each other's company. There's physical contact and there's just a, there's a way to touch base and make sure that everybody slept well. We talk about what they dreamt and I always tease my third that, you know, it's always about mom. It's a, What'd you dream about, mom? You know, as soon as she can't even finish the sentence, I'll just interject it because it's always about mom. And you know, there's these little rituals that come with that. Now, the next thing that we'll do, because we're a religious family, is we'll do scripture study for 10 or 15 minutes. You don't have to do something like that, but I do recommend that you do something where you're instilling some sort of values or some sort of principles in with your kids. You can teach them, you can read Aesop's fables, you can teach them some other sort of principle, but we spend the first 10 to 15 minutes after we've kind of gotten up and everybody's going by doing scripture study and by talking about what these principles are, teaching them the idea of what it means to be a good person, what good and evil actually look like, what it means to, to sacrifice for the people that you love or to be willing to stand for things as opposed to just being pragmatic. So we teach them these things. Then we'll do family prayer, it's a ritual. And again, you don't need to be religious, you do need to engage in ritual with your family. Every culture on a macro level that has been a successful culture, the people who are a part of it, they have rituals. They have things that they engage in physically. We kneel, we fold our arms, we bow our heads, we expect our children to be quiet and silent unless they're the ones who are actually saying the prayers. You engage in some sort of a ritual because when your kids see that ritual matters, then they can also start to understand the value of it. They can start to see the symbolism of it. They can start to find their own peace in it. I love what George was talking about as far as bedtime routines. A bedtime routine is nothing more than a ritual. And ritual provides us with security. It provides us with an understanding. Now, that doesn't mean mindless rituals. My kids are engaged in that at some point. And if you just allow it to be mindless, then it doesn't do you as nearly as much good as it could. But you start off with it, and then you allow it to deepen even further. After that, either I go to the gym or my wife goes to the gym because we have to sharpen our axes, right? I go three days a week, she goes three days a week, so we just kind of take turns. And in order for us to function at our highest level, we have to take care of ourselves physically, we have to take care of ourselves emotionally, we have to take care of ourselves mentally, spiritually, and in every other regard, separately from the kids. Now, one of the things that we're actively talking about is instead of going to the gym, setting up a gym at home in our basement because we want our kids to be able to see, I mean, they know that mom and dad go to the gym. They have some sort of an idea of what we do there, but we want them to see even more so what that looks like. We want to be able to have them 
engage in that and have physical fitness and taking care of your body and having that be an important thing, we want them to see that in real time. And so that's one of the things that we're considering doing as a family is we try and build an even stronger family culture ourselves. But we sharpen our axes every morning and we take turns so that each one of us can do it. Now, after we get back and everybody's kind of ready and, and everything's gone through, then I'm, I'll work. I work from home. And so my kids know that when the door is shut, they don't get to come in and barge in and come bug me. Well, our kids have boundaries. And there are consequences for not, for not obeying what those boundaries are. It doesn't mean that I'm angry when it happens, although if there are times that I am angry and I wish that I weren't. I wish that I could be better, as Dr. Sean was saying, as far as disassociating the anger from the consequences and being able to just teach them dispassionately. But my kids understand that it's not, oh, well, I'm going to count to three, and then you have to go, okay, well, now I'm going to count to, th okay, now I'm going to count to three. No, you follow through. And our kids know, my kids are very obedient, and they're very good at not only just following the rules, but starting to understand why the rules are. One of the things that we've been doing a lot lately, especially with my two older kids, is if we tell them to do something and they say why, the way kids whine, because that's just kind of our natural tendency, is we will say, that's not the right answer. You say, okay, dad, how come? Because we're happy to have our kids ask us and try to understand. Neither my wife or I expect any sort of blind obedience from them. We also don't expect them to think that we have to justify our answers or our dictates to them because we don't. They're not our little gods and we don't have to justify anything to them. So we expect them to obey and if they want to understand why, then they can ask how come. And we also expect them to do it cheerfully. So I go to work and then my two oldest kids will, they'll do homeschool. They'll start off, that's the first thing that they'll do during the morning. One of the reasons we do that is because we want our kids to understand that you do the hard things first. You do the important things first. It's hard for them. My son hates it, especially because the homeschool curriculum that they're following right now is it's all based on a computer program that's teaching them the simple stuff like reading, writing, math, and a little bit of science. You know, and as they get older, then we'll start doing, doing things differently. But for now, this curriculum is working. My husband, or my, my, uh, my husband, my son hates it. He hates it. He throws fits about it, and we're working with him to get over it. But the big thing that we're trying to do is to help him understand that you do the hard things first. Same thing with if there's a food that they don't like, that they have to at least try that, and you're better off if you try eating that first, and then you can enjoy the rest of your meal. That's a very intentional thing that happens on our part. My, my, my uh, third child, my uh, second daughter, she does the same thing when it comes to throwing, throwing fits about having naps. She hates it. She's two and a half. She doesn't want to have to take a nap, especially when her older siblings are done playing. She just wants to be, or when they're out playing, when they're done with preschool, she just wants to go out and play with them. And it's funny because this has been a fight for a little while, and my wife just texted me today, and she said, my, da my daughter's name is Birdie, and she said, Birdie came in at 10.30, which is like two hours earlier than what her normal nap time is, and she said, Mom, I'm tired, I want to take a nap, will you sing to me? And my two-and-a-half-year-old is really almost about that articulate because she's ridiculously smart and I'm in trouble. But she says that. And so even as a little kid, just by reinforcing what those principles are, she's starting to understand more value in it. And especially because we go out of our way to try and help our children understand things. Now we'll go throughout the day, but I come down and we eat lunch together. We don't always get to do dinner together because we have different responsibilities, my wife and I. Um, but we always make it a point to try and eat lunch together. I'll kind of clock out for a little while and I'll come down and we'll do that. We'll talk about what their day's how it's been and what's been going on. And so we get some engaged family time. Then it's back to work and back to them playing outside. And honestly, one of the things that we're doing with our two oldest right now, especially now that it's spring, is again, almost seven and five. And we're lucky enough that we live in a community that's, that's very, it's a safe area, but we send our kids off and just, we taught our oldest to look at a watch and we hope to not see them for four or five hours. You guys who have kids know how hard that is at first, right? It kind of references what uh, Sean was talking about in his workshop about this idea of dads have to, we have to kind of push our kids out of the nest. We have to challenge them. We have to let them do things that may put us outside of our comfort zone. And that's one of the things that I'm learning more and more as a dad is that being a good father means that I'm getting out of my comfort zone just as much as I expect my own children to get out of their comfort zones. And in a lot of ways, them, in fact, not in every way, when it comes to that particular action, 
My sending them to go out and play in the neighborhood and to not be able to keep an eye on them is infinitely harder on me than it is on them. They love the freedom. They love it, and it's good for them because they need to be able to have that kind of freedom, even though sometimes it's hard for us as protective people to want to let that go and to want to let that happen. So they come in, we do dinner, we kind of go through everything else. Let me tell you a little bit about what our bedtime routine is because the bedtime routine is important. We do what's called the guzzy breakdown. And what we'll do is whoever's leading will say, who are we? And then everybody in the family says, guzzies. What do we do? Hard things is the first thing we talk about. Okay, dad, what was your hard thing today? And I have to rack my brain and think, well, it was sparring. Or it was, you know, I had, it was leg day. Or I, you know, I had to try and recover a sales call that wasn't going very well or whatever else it was. And then, okay, Hazel, what was your hard thing? And we go through everybody in the family. It's not just the kids. At first, it was just the kids. And then I realized that as I was trying to answer those questions in my own head, there were days that I couldn't think of a hard thing that I had done or one of these other things that I had done. And I realized that I needed to be as accountable to that as they were. And so that's when I changed it and said, you know, my wife and I needed to start answering this too. So everybody goes through and they talk about their hard thing. And one of the things when they're little that they do is they talk about hard things that happened to them. And then we keep reinforcing that, no, 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 that doesn't count. I don't want to hear about the hard thing that happened to you. If the hard thing happened, what did you do to conquer it? Did you have a good attitude about it? Were you brave instead of scared? What did you do to conquer that hard thing? Because we don't want our kids to think that they are, they are objects that are acted upon. They're not victims. They are agents of action unto themselves. And so we want them to understand that hard things when we ask you what hard things you did today, I don't care what happened to you, I care about what you did with what was difficult for you. So then everybody goes through that and then we do it again. Who are we? Guzzies. What do we do? Good things. This is where we get to reinforce some of the moral codes that we teach as a family. What are the things that you've done today that are good, that are moral, that are upright, that are taking care of what it means to be a good person? And we go through all of that. Who are we? Guzzies. What do we do? Kind things. Okay, so what are some of the kind things that we've done? This is the one that I struggle with, especially because a lot of times the thing, I can think of a million things that I've done throughout that day. Maybe it's as simple as, you know, brushing my youngest teeth or filling up their water or something else like that. And I don't think of that as a particularly kind thing. I just think of it as doing my job. But I don't want my kids to think of that as me doing my job. I want them to realize that that's a kind thing that I'm doing for them. And so we go through and we talk about what those kind things are. And then because I'm kind of, you know, uptight and we're like this, then my wife very kindly made the recommendation of we need to add one more and it's fun things because otherwise I would just focus on like the work and all that other stuff. And she's totally right because you can't have a culture and you can't have a successful family without having fun things that come with it. It can't just be all punishment and no praise, like has, has already been spoken to a bunch of different times. It can't be all work and no play. If we're going to have a successful family culture, there needs to be just as much fun as there is growth and development. And so the last thing we talk about is what are the fun things? This is another one that both my wife and I really kind of struggle with is sometimes throughout the day, we don't really get to have that much fun because she's homeschooling, I'm working, there's other things that are going on. And so what's nice is as we go throughout this routine, then it makes us think as we go throughout the day, it's like, okay, I'm going to have to tell the kids that once again, I didn't do anything fun, which means I'm really not being a good guzzy. So I better do something fun, even if it's just wrestling with my son for a few minutes, or it's playing pretend with my daughter for a little while, or it's that, you know, I got to take a break and I got to watch a YouTube video instead of doing another call or something else like that so that they see again that we're sharpening our own axes, that we're taking taking care of ourselves and that we're doing fun things. Then we once again do family prayer and we have the kids say their own prayers and then we kind of do stories and that kind of stuff. And if you guys, if you have little kids, you don't read to your kids and you don't do the voices and you don't get into it like you're a broadcaster, you're missing out because that is so fun. And your kids will absolutely love it and they will eat it up because they get to see you as dad get to be bigger than life. You get to create these environments and these stories and these tales and these other things that as they read them, my, my two oldest, they know how to read, but they can't read with the same level. They still ask me to do it all the time when it comes to bedtime because I can do it in a way that brings it to life. That's a skill. That's something that I encourage you to practice because I've gotten better at it. I'm still not great at it, but I've gotten better at it and I absolutely love it. It's fantastic for them. Then... 
By that time, it's about 7.30, 8 o'clock, and the kids are done. It's bedtime. They go to bed at the same time every single night. One, because that's what keeps them sane, but way more importantly, that's what gives me and my wife some time to not just be parents, right? Because just like Hunter was talking about, we talked about, obviously, you know, you take care of what your own needs are. We do the gym, I do work, my wife does some of her stuff, we do that. Obviously, there's the parenting component, which is what I've hit on quite a bit, but there also needs to be the relationship component, the lover archetype that comes in there. So my wife and I, we have these three, four hours after the kids go to bed that are sacred for us. They really are. Sometimes, honestly, it's just watching something like Justified on, on Netflix or whatever. We really, sometimes it's just nights like that. Sometimes we'll both just be sitting next to each other and we'll be reading books. It, I mean, the, the nights vary, but what's important is that we get time together to just be alone, the two of us. So that it's not just that she's the mother of my children or I'm the father of her children, but we get to maintain that relationship between the two of us as well. We had a night, and I, you know, now I'm, I'll start talking about things that are a little bit more than just what our daily routine is, but we had a night, we go out on a date um, twice a month, and we had a night the other night that um, we just wanted to go to the gym together on our date, that was it. Because we both enjoy going, and we never get to go together anymore because of the way that the situation is with the kids. And so we had her sister who comes over like every third Friday so that we can go out. And we went to the gym and then we had a cheat night. We just binged ourselves stupid on a bunch of junk food. And it was fantastic, you know? And so the idea of even keeping your marriage something that you're constantly working on, you're constantly engaging and you're constantly enjoying. When I get back uh, this week, uh, I get back and we get to spend all day Wednesday without the kids because my parents are going to be watching them. My wife and I love the alone time that we get together because it's a way for us to remind ourselves and to remember that we are still going to love being around each other even when the kids are grown up and gone. We still get to engage with each other as husband and wife, as lovers, as everything else as opposed to it's just mother and father and feeling that dynamic. So obviously there's the, there's the daily component of it. We've got other weekly rituals. We go to church on Sundays. Uh, fam- Monday night is kind of a, is a family night. So we do, even for those family nights, we do things where one Monday a month we do a hard thing together. Another one will do a good thing. Another one will do a kind thing. Another one we do a fun thing. We just kind of rotate through those as we go so that we can focus on those more on this kind of macro level. And again, it's good for the kids because half the time they don't want to do the hard things or the kind things. Really, they just want to do the fun things because the fun thing is going to the trampoline park or it's going sledding or it's going to the skate park or something else. But what I love is that they start to recognize that when we do the hard things together as a family or when we do the kind things together as a family, when we go out and we find a neighbor and uh, we go weed their garden or something else, that those are often the fun things that when we do our guzzy breakdown at the end of the night, They'll talk about the hard thing that we did together as a family that day was also their fun thing for that day. Their attitudes start to change. They start to adapt to this idea of what it means to have fun and to enjoy family time and to embrace doing all that together. So we have our our weekly things that we do. I talked about the fact that my wife and I have our monthly things where we do day nights and we try and do, uh, we try and do uh, another religious, you know, and I have, I don't want to go too deep into kind of the nuances of what our religious beliefs are, but I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Most of you guys know us as Mormons. We do, we go to the temple every week. We do, um, I oversee all the young men in our, in our congregation who are between the ages of like 16 and 18. So I do that every Tuesday. My wife oversees all the youth for sports. And so she does that every Thursday night. And we do stuff like we try to go to the temple individually every week, but then we try to go together as a couple every month. So that's another one of our monthly rituals that again, we do together as a couple. But then even on a bigger scale, we try and go and visit with my extended, you know, with my family or her family. We're really grateful that where we are in Salt Lake, that my family's an hour away, her family's 20 minutes away. We're very intentionally there. I mean, you guys, I, we can live anywhere we want to in the world. We really can. Not only is my work location independent, but our kids are homeschooled. We could live anywhere in the world we wanted to. And we very intentionally have decided to buy a home within half an hour of both of our families, because family for us is that important. It's just, it's that important for us. And it's the idea of that culture, those shared beliefs, that support system, having our kids grow up around cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents who support the culture that we're trying to build and then also offer their own versions and twists on it. 
That's way more important for us than travel or buying a home that's half the price because the Utah market is stupid expensive right now or any other variable. It's that culture that drives all of our decisions for where we are and why we've decided to be there. So getting to be with our family and doing things that way. There are other things that go into it, like what Christmas is or what Thanksgiving is. But then there's even other little micro things that go into it. What's the language that you use? I remember a few years ago, I was getting ready to do, my daughter and I, my oldest, were getting ready to do something. She was three. I don't remember what it was. And we were getting ready to do it. And she says, yeah, Dad, let's do it. And it sounded really familiar to me. I couldn't figure out. It's like, where, is, that, is that a quote from a movie? Like, why, why does she say it like this? And I heard her say it a bunch of times. And then I was out with some friends the other day and, or, you know, the other day, a few days after, and I heard myself say that exact, that exact thing and I realized that she picked it up from me. You know, my, my little three-year-old, she'll say, what the heck? And it just sounds exactly like my wife when she says it. You know, the intonation and everything is perfect and it's all like that. We are not, we don't do that intentionally and we should be better about intentionally using the language that we do. Well, you know, I should say we are because we teach, we teach our kids to use big words, you know, or to be articulate or things like that. We certainly teach them to avoid using other words. But even things like, you know, and of course I'm going to talk about this, but even little things like how you dress as a father. There's not a culture that doesn't have appearance as part of what it is. You guys who have read my book or have seen it know that every, every example that I pull from that talks about the relationship between masculinity and aesthetics is related to a particular culture. What kind of culture are you creating by dressing the way that you do? If you can talk about the fact that we do hard things, that we, we care about the, or what our reputation is and we, we have a place that we want to make in the world and we're ambitious or whatever else, but through our language, through our hobbies, through our appearance, through everything else, if all we're really doing is showing that the thing that matters most is comfort, then there's dissonance. And the culture we're trying to create is not the same thing as the culture we actually are creating. So it's all those little things. It's the language that we use. It's the clothing that we wear. It's even the things like the symbols that we can adopt. It's the things like the mottos that we have. It's the things that we tell ourselves. It's the kind of vacations that we go on. It's what our work routines are like. It's all of these little variables. And all these little things, if they happen on accident, it still creates a culture. I'm sure every single one of you can think about the little things the traditions, the habits, the everything else that happened for you as you were kids growing up. I can certainly think of those that happened for me. And half the time when I ask my parents why they did things that way, I don't know, it was just how we did it. And there's nothing, well, I shouldn't say, there used to be nothing wrong with that because again, the macro culture was strong enough that it would reinforce what they were trying to do as parents. But again, we don't get that luxury. We don't. We don't get to be lazy. We don't get to just say, I don't know. It just happened that way. We have to be intentional about everything that we're doing about creating that culture. And if we are, then that will give our kids a sense of identity. And that will allow them to be strong enough in what that identity is. Because the thing that the task that we have at hand for us is I think one of the most difficult in the world. Because what we have to do is create moral rebels. And I know that sounds oxymoronic, but that's really what we're creating is morally good people who are rebels against the world that we live in. We have to teach them to be in the world and to not be the weirdo kids that can't actually identify with anybody else because then again, you don't get to expand your microculture into something bigger. We need to teach them to be in the world, but not of the world. That's an incredibly difficult thing to do, especially because the world is so enticing. The world through music, through media, through culture, through friends, through everything else, is so enticing. And if we're not incredibly intentional and incredibly deliberate about what the culture is and the identity is that we're helping our children to create, then the world will pull them in and they will become part of Rome. They will become part of Babylon. And that's the problem, is that we'll lose them. We can't just trust on inertia. We can't just trust on another culture. We can't even just trust. I mean, you guys, when I hear you talk about... Sometimes it really breaks my heart to, to come to this convention, and I've been doing it for the last four years, and to hear you men talk about the situation that you're in, because the West, for a lot of us, when it comes to the family, you live in ruins. And where I am, the culture that I live in, that, I'm be that I belong to, the, the part of the world that I live in, the neighborhoods that I'm in, my family, my church, my community, and everything else, 
I'm in a little oasis. You guys will hear people talk about like tradcon LARPing and everything else and it's all just role play. I get to live that for real, I really do. My wife is not an outlier for being a stay at home mom. She's not, the majority of her peers stay home full time. Most of her peers, most of our peers, they want anywhere from three to six kids. You know, we want the division of labor. I don't, I live in a little oasis, but I see those borders slowly shrinking and I see rot starting to come up because the world is so good at making men lazy and complacent, at making women ungrateful and masculine. And if we don't protect ourselves from that, then our kids are in serious trouble. We have to do everything we can on a micro level to create the kind of environment that gives our kids the identity necessary for being moral rebels in a world that does not have their best interests in mind at all. That's what our responsibility is as patriarchs. That's what our responsibility is when it comes to the welfare and the well-being of our children. Because, and really the best way that I've ever heard it put is from a man named David O. McKay. And the way that he said it is, no success in life can compensate for failure in the home. Now, you can think about that on two ways. The things that I do in my life, the, my ambition, my drives, my successes, if I think about it to a large extent, really, a lot of times it's just me trying to make up for what my crappy, like the things that sucked about my childhood. My parents were fantastic, but they weren't perfect. And I have to deal with some of the, the scars, the wounds, the whatever victim language you want to use, and I wish there was something better, but I get to deal with all that. And a lot of the reasons the way that I am and my work, my work ethic and my ambition comes from the fact that I'm trying to compensate for what their failure in the home was. And I can't. And nobody ever will, will get to because we won't ever have perfect parents. I won't, I'm, I'm not a perfect dad, I never will be. But that doesn't mean that we get off easy. It just means that we have to do everything we can to not fail in the home because I want my kids to be able to be successful because of the things that I do well as a father, not just in spite of the things that I do well as a father. So again, no success in life can compensate for failure in the home, and that goes back to why we are the way we are, and that certainly speaks to what our responsibility as men, as fathers, and as patriarchs is. That's what I try to live by. I hope that that's something that I've been able to help you guys live by and think more about, and so I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me join you guys. Sense is patriarchy. We're here to do work as men, as patriarchs. There's nothing more natural than being a father.